world's largest television set, 14 stories high. It's on display here at Japan's High Tech Expo 85 outside Tokyo. It's made by Sony, a Japanese manufacturer. Indeed, the Japanese have dominated the world market in television, stereos, VCRs, and cameras. But what about computers? What happened to the so-called Japanese threat there? Today, we take a big look at Japanese computer technology on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. Computer Chronicles is brought to you in part by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Popular Computing Magazine, featuring microcomputer applications that increase productivity for managers and professionals. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Schaffe. Gary Kildall is off this week. Last week, we went to Japan to take a look at Japanese computer technology. This week, we have part two of our review of Japanese high-tech. What we found in Japan was an absolute fascination with technology in general and robots in particular. All this was very evident when we went to visit the Japanese high-tech Expo 85 in Tsukuba, also known as Science City. About an hour's train ride north of Tokyo is Tsukuba. Once a small town, it has become the showpiece of Japan's reach into the future. It is now the host of two centers of intensive activity, one for research and one for show. The first is Tsukuba Science City, part of a far-reaching scheme begun over 20 years ago to combine the best of Japan's research facilities with new universities and high-tech manufacturing. By concentrating labs, mines, and money, the government hopes to create the ideal environment for scientific breakthroughs. Transferring the new technologies to daily life is left to private industry, sharing the results of long-term research. Part of the grand scheme of Tsukuba seems to be influenced by the Japanese fear that the younger generation is not interested in science careers and that Japan's educational system is holding back the development of original thinkers. Tsukuba's other showpiece is small on research but big on spectacle. Expo 85 is a giant high-tech show of the future with a good dose of science fiction. It's hard to pinpoint Expo's goal. The futuristic buildings and costumes have a comic book style, and Walt Disney seems to have influenced many of the exhibits. But Japan's technological prowess is evident, even when masked by gondola rides and 3D movies. Dancing humanoids, giant pastel cones and floating cubes, a TV as big as an office building, and crowds, crowds, crowds. Expo 85 is a frenzy of color, sound, and movement. Some of it bizarre, but all of it remarkable. At first glance, the pavilions of Tsukuba look like a 1950 idea of cities of the future. Simple geometric shapes and primary colors share the landscape with monorails, floating cars, and futuristic fashions. And everywhere, children. But the fairground atmosphere hides the serious purpose and some advanced computer technology. At the Toshiba Pavilion's Electro Plaza, visitors were greeted by multi-jointed, top-spinning robots performing a kind of circus of amazing feats.
touch-sensitive robots are accompanied by an eight-jointed inspection arm, the first of its kind in the world. Equipped with a total of 104 sensors, it boasts 18 degrees of movement and a CCD camera to watch over the other robots. Fujitsu, better known for its computers, featured another performing robot, but of a different scale. The awesome Fanuc Man is the world's largest humanoid robot, standing 5 meters tall and weighing 25 tons. With its optical sensors and ambidextrous arms, Fanuc is both precise and powerful. It can build a delicate miniature model of itself, but is strong enough to lift a 200 kilogram barbell. Almost as popular as Tsukuba's robots were computerized translating devices, including Fujitsu's automatic multilingual news service. From a live news feed originating in English, this prototype system provides instantaneous translation into French, German, and Japanese. The NEC Corporation went a step further, demonstrating live simultaneous interpretation. We want to go back to this hotel as soon as possible. Highly developed voice recognition and reproduction systems are given high priority in Japan, where the complexity of the language is a serious obstacle to computer exports. Language was also a concern at one of the biggest foreign pavilions, that of the Soviet Union. Behind the socialist realism and the model space station was an ordinary looking PC with some unusual talents. Zero. Okay. Seven. Ten. Okay. Ten. Eight. Ten. Okay. Ten. Эта система синтезирует произвольный текст на русском языке. This machine synthesizes several Indo-European languages. It can understand 200 different commands and answers to the voice of the operator. Voice recognition is still difficult. At the moment, this machine answers only to the voice of the operator, but we are working on new models that can understand fluent speech, not just special commands. Among the 46 foreign participants, Italy demonstrated an unconventional application of computer technology, a painting analyzer. It's able to measure the layering of the paint and so determine whether the painting is genuine or a fake. In this case, the analysis discovered several earlier versions of the painting hidden beneath the finished product. The Europeans also excelled in combining computers with communication. France showed a model of its Minitel, the French answer, to the electronic cottage. As a first step to linking homes with databases, this diminutive terminal looks like an electronic telephone directory, searching out numbers and constantly being updated. It will give you the latest news and weather, mail order catalogs, and you can even book a seat on France's version of the bullet train. Robots were lacking from most of the foreign exhibits, but the French did show one multi-jointed robot designed for disabled persons and operated by voice command. At the West German Pavilion, the telephone company had an extensive display of integrated communications equipment. Relying on the future digitizing of transmission lines, the Deutsche Bundespost demonstrated its multi-service terminal, combining high-speed telefacsimile, digital picture transmission, and voicemail. You have two messages. The Japanese telephone company, NTT, showed its own plan for future telecommunications, also dependent on a digital switching system. It features picture transmission and a video phone. Japan has just finished laying optical fiber cable the length of the country and has begun facsimile and sketch phone service to some cities. Public telephones using a kind of cash card are already common in Tokyo. The latest video phone technology was overshadowed, literally, by Expo's other television novelty presented by Sony. A color TV with a 25 by 40 meter screen, about 10,000 times larger than a typical home set. The mammoth jumbotron is made up of 150,000 luminous elements, each about the size of a human hand and containing the three primary colors. 
Digital picture images are sent to respective sections of the screen by a central computer. Unlike conventional TVs, the picture elements emit light constantly, making it visible even in bright daylight. Japan Airlines' contribution to Expo 85 was, of course, in new transportation, the HSST, a kind of bullet train without wheels. It rides above the track on a magnetic cushion at speeds of up to 300 kilometers an hour. Of all the robots at Tsukuba, one group at the Japanese National Pavilion stood out among the rest. Three astonishing machines with human-like abilities never before seen in a robot. Wasabot is the child of Dr. Ichiro Kato of Tokyo's Wasada University. Dr. Kato has been doing research on anthropomorphic robots for 20 years, beginning with replacement parts for the human body. Dr. Kato expects the real era of robots to be fast approaching. In 20 years, we will be in the 21st century. At that time, I believe, we will be in the real era of the robot. Robots will be more than just factory machines. We will have personal robots for offices and homes. But current factory robots are not very flexible. For robots to be able to perform a variety of tasks that humans can do, they will have to resemble humans in both shape and action. Wasabot is human-like in more than just appearance. Controlling his movement are 80 microprocessors arranged hierarchically, like the human nervous system. Wasubot's arms and legs have 50 degrees of movement, more than any other existing robot. In each joint is a one-chip microcomputer. Fifty of the chips form a software servo system. This takes the place of hardware to obtain feedback. Wasubot is made up of systems right arm and leg, left arm and leg, the sound and the vision. It is a 30 structure model that works from the top down like a human being. Compared to a synthesizer, Wasabot's human-like approach to playing the organ may seem like the most difficult way for a computer to create music, but there is a reason for the circuitous method. We chose to do it this way for a simple reason, to establish the basic technology for robots of the 21st century. We have succeeded in giving Wasubot the two necessary functions, strength and skill. The balance of strength and skill is evident in another of Dr. Kato's creations, a walking biped robot. Weighing 120 kilos, the biped needs tremendous strength just to move. Each hip contains a hydraulic power source and a microcomputer. Human walking action is extremely difficult to duplicate. Balancing on one foot, it would be normal for the upright robot to fall down, just from the high center of gravity. 
Accompanying the biped was a four-legged walker with a special ability to climb stairs. You only need one leg to move, so three legs are always supporting it. Compared to the biped robot, the quadruped is a very simple machine. It is like early human beings, who used four limbs and later used their arms for culture and civilization. By watching these robots, you begin to appreciate the difficulty of the human mechanism. To Dr. Kato, personal robots of the future will follow naturally behind other 20th century inventions. After the family car and the personal computer comes the personal robot, but he sees some obstacles along the way. The the advance of technology will accelerate, and I don't think anything will stop it. But when it comes to the society that will use that technology, individuals may not be able to change their consciousness as rapidly. If this gap gets wide enough, it could be catastrophic. We must find a way to change how people will react. To Dr. Kato, the industrial robots on display at Tsukuba are just new kinds of automatic machines, adept at tricks and entertainment. But in spite of their appearance, and sometimes because of it, they seem to possess uncanny human talents. Regardless of how much progress we make, you have to keep in mind that these are only machines, not living beings. We will see many advances over the next 20 or 30 years, artificial organs for example. To me it is frightening because these things are for living beings, to support human life, but robots are only machines. That's the basic difference. That's a little robot I picked up while I was in Japan. Gary's going to be very jealous, I know. So, will robots be doing the vacuuming, the shopping, all the dirty work in the future? Our commentator, Paul Schindler, has some thoughts on that.
Oh, I was just working on my robot practice. You know, you've seen on the show what the Japanese are doing in robotics. They're so far ahead of us, it's hard to see their dust from where we are. You know, they got that lead because they had to have it. Japan has a labor shortage. Now, someday, when all of us baby boomers get older, we'll have a labor shortage in this country, too. But I'm not worried about the Japanese lead in robotics. They need robots right now. We don't yet. When we need them, we'll simply unleash that old-fashioned American know-how, roll up our sleeves, and steal every robotic idea in Japan that's not tied down. You know, I'm kind of looking forward to that day around the turn of the century when Japanese newspapers are full of stories about Americans imitating, not innovating, in robotics. Since the Japanese culture is better attuned to irony than ours, they'll probably appreciate the turnabout. We probably won't. So three cheers for the Japanese who already know what we must still learn, that manual labor is best done by machines. That's my opinion. I'm Paul Schindler. In the random access file this week, IBM is flexing its hardware muscle to sell software. IBM said it will be offering dealers free copies of IBM's word processing and spreadsheet programs plus TopView, all to be given away to buyers of PC XTs. Some software houses are crying foul, fearing that IBM buyers will no longer buy third-party software with their new computers, and some dealers are crying foul, fearing the loss of those nice margins on software sales. IBM also took an aggressive stance this week in the printer market, announcing the end of its deal with Epson and the launching of a new American-made printer. The new IBM printer, called the Pro Printer, will sell for $549 and will run at three different speeds depending on whether you want speed or letter quality. IBM says the price on its Pro Printer is about $100 less than a comparable Japanese-made printer. IBM also introduced a new color, inkjet printer. Epson made its own moves last week, announcing several new printers, among them a new dot matrix printer called the Home Writer. It's expected to sell for under $200. It features near letter quality type at 100 characters per second. The spring Comdex is over now, a much smaller Comdex than in earlier years. The highlight was late entry Atari, which decided, after all, to show off the first production version of its new 520ST. It's still being promised for the summer. They're still lining up in the AT clone battle. The new entrant is the Zenith Z200, promising 512K standard and speeds up to 30% faster than the IBM PC AT. Other current entrants in the AT clone field are Compaq, Capro, Texas Instruments, Corona, Televideo, with others expected soon, including Tandy and Hewlett Packard. Some breakthroughs announced this past week in the development of parallel processing computers. Two firms say they've developed new machines which can run at speeds approaching the much more expensive supercomputers. One new machine called the Butterfly links 128 Motorola 68000 chips to accomplish speeds of 60 million instructions per second. The other machine called the Connection couples 1,000 chips, each containing 16 microprocessors, to achieve speeds of 250 MIPS. Also, Intel announced it will soon introduce its own parallel processing computer, which uses 128 chips to achieve speeds of 100 MIPS. Our fast-talking software reviewer Paul Schindler is up next with his pick for the week. I'm wearing my banker's pinstripes and counting this pitiful wad of cash in order to get ready to play Bank President, one of the most interesting and yet strangest simulation games I've ever run into. The company says it's just the first of a series of chief executive officer software games. In this game, you get to be the chief executive officer of a major bank. You either play against other bankers or the computer. Every aspect of the game environment is under your control. Let's have a look. First of all, you establish the regulatory environment. Maximum interest rates, required reserves, minimum capital. Then the game shows you, either with colorful graphics or detailed tables, the results of the previous quarter. You decide how much interest you want to pay and what kind of loans you want to make. Bank president then calculates a quarter's worth of results and displays them. Now, just for the heck of it, I decided to offer 20% on checking accounts. Well, it dropped the stock price from $70 to $17, so I guess it wasn't such a good idea. Bank President is so addictive, at least one major bank has banned it entirely. If you want to see what the fuss is about, try Bank President, $75 from Lewis Lee Corporation, Palo Alto, California. For Random Access, I'm Paul Schindler. A company called Logical Business Systems has announced a new add-on board for the IBM PC that allows it to respond to spoken commands. The system called Voice Command has a vocabulary of 32,000 words and essentially lets you turn any software keyboard commands into spoken commands. 
Problems apparently continue at Apple as the company has again lowered its 1985 sales projections. Apple spokesman also acknowledged the layoff of 75 workers and the elimination of 1,500 part-time jobs. Apple said cost-cutting is now a high priority. Blue Cross and Blue Shield in Maryland have announced a new laser ID card for subscribers that carries up to 800 pages of medical history on it. The optically encoded data would include past medical problems, digitized x-rays, and complete insurance information. The cards would be read by machines located at hospitals and other health care providers. Blue Cross says the availability of instant medical information would save lives in emergency situations. General Motors has been struggling to make a decision on where to locate its new $3.5 billion plant to manufacture the new Saturn car, with several states competing for the plant. Now GM says it has turned the decision over to a computer, and that company Humans will intervene in the decision only if the computer comes up with a tie. Two hackers from Santa Cruz, California say they've come up with a computer program that can beat the house at roulette. They say the computer analyzes the friction characteristics of a particular roulette wheel, resulting in a 44% advantage to the player. And if you think computers are all about numbers, poet Michael Newman has come up with something called a poetry processor. It helps you write poetry by automatically analyzing meter, cadence, and alliteration. It also comes with a built-in rhyming dictionary. And finally, the ultimate in literary software is a new program called Ractor. It doesn't help you write. It writes books all by itself. Its first novel is now complete. It's called The Policeman's Beard is Half Constructed. Early on, Ractor writes, quote, Reflections are images of tarnished aspirations. I don't know what it means either. That's it for this week's Computer Chronicles. We'll see you next week. The Computer Chronicles was brought to you in part by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Popular Computing Magazine, featuring microcomputer applications that increase productivity for managers and professionals. Hotel accommodations in Japan provided by the Capital Tokyo Hotel, a member of the Tokyo Hotel chain, with hotels throughout Japan and the Far East. Air transportation courtesy of Japan Airlines, providing service to 33 countries around the world.